thank you so much, E, for, for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. And I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time now. Uh, looking forward to digging in on a number of subjects, but you're really well known uh, as one of the leading tech entrepreneurs from, from Africa and really worldwide. Uh, very young guy, founder and general partner of, of Future Africa, also formerly founded and led Andela as well as Flutterwave. Uh, and you're also working on bu building a city. So uh, certainly pretty busy. Uh, I think the best way to get started would just be to hear for those people who aren't so familiar, uh, kind of your story from, from the bottom up, from growing up in Nigeria to where you are today. Awesome. So my name is Inyolua Aboyeji, but most people just call me the letter E. Um, you know, I, I was born and I grew up in Nigeria. Um, you know, I, um, I was, um, uh, you know, I was, I went to school, um, here as well. And then, um, when I was, um, when I finished high school, I went to Canada, um, for my last year of high school. And then, um, I went to, I went to the university of Waterloo, um, where I spent, um, um, quite a number of years, um, uh, studying law and economics, <laughs> and then um, I, I I actually started a company while I was in Waterloo. Um, spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, in the company in Waterloo. It was an amazing experience. I learned quite a bit, uh, and then um, and then um, uh, I, I started a company called Booknetter.com. And the company was an interesting company. We basically pivoted quite a bit. Um, moved from selling, from trying to build a social learning platform to displace Blackboard to um, building like a, like a platform that students were sharing past exam questions on to building a, a platform for professors who wanted to build um, software um, to help students who were outside of their classes um, learn, um, like, like participate in their classrooms uh, for a fee. So I did that. Um, company didn't end up being a huge success, um, but you know, I learned a lot of very practical entrepreneurship lessons, uh, but took those lessons and moved back to Nigeria, where I started working uh, on a project called Fora. The big idea then was, you know, there were a lot of MOOCs at the time, lots of subjects that universities in Nigeria didn't have faculty to teach. So we wanted to bring, introduce some of those MOOCs and have the universities offer certificates for these courses. Um, anyway, um, it required some regulatory approval from the Nigerian Universities Commission, which regulates universities, and they didn't give that approval. So I had to, to also pivot again. <laughs> uh, luckily, what I pivoted into was what we call Andela uh, today. And um, I guess the rest is history from that point on. Yeah, it's, it's a great story. And uh, I'm kind of in awe of like how much you've done so so quickly in life, uh, you know, without really any advantages coming to, to Canada, starting a company there, pivoting a few times. And next thing you know, it, you're raising millions of dollars, and you have one of the most successful companies in Africa. Uh, you talked about how you went to Waterloo, studied economics and law. But I understand you had sort of an entrepreneurial bug, uh, kind of all the way through, I think you mentioned like, hustling and selling snacks in, in school and maybe elementary yeah, school. Yeah, high like school. That. Yeah, in high school, um, I was part of what is called the Junior Achievement Program. But I mean, before that, uh, I had, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, my school was a boarding school and you weren't allowed to have um, provisions or snacks. But hey, we, you know, we, we sold snacks illegally. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, but it was, you know, I would, I'll be honest, you know, it's... Um, um, it's been an interesting, it's been an interesting time to be, to be very honest. Um, uh, I, I learned quite a bit from all my entrepreneurial surgeons, both from, you know, engaging with, um, with, with other kids at school and selling snacks, um, all the way up till, you know, now where, you know, I'm basically building solutions for other folks. So yeah, it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's worse things you could be selling than snacks. So it sounds like a pretty innocent way to get started. Um, when you went to Canada, did you ever consider like that you might not be coming back to Nigeria? Um, you know, 
I'll be honest. I, 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 I thought I wouldn't come back to Nigeria. <laughs> um, I, I definitely imagined I wouldn't have to come back to Nigeria. But I think, you know, um, what was uh, interesting about that period of time um, when I decided to come back was, you know, there was a lot of excitement. I came back in 2012. Um, you know, while the country had quite a number of challenges, there was also a period of incredible growth uh, for the economy. Um, so, yeah, so it was, um, you know, it was, it was a very interesting time, to be, to be very honest. Um, it, was, it was a very interesting time. <laughs> so, and, and then you went and you built Andela, and I know you've talked about your, your previous companies at length, and so, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on them. I'm sure you're yeah, kind of yeah, on yeah. the next. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, but with Andela, uh, just like the, the one thing I'm wondering is, you know, you basically pioneered this concept of income share agreements, the ISA that now like Lambda yeah. School is, is very well known for. How did that Absolutely. idea come to, come to concept for you in the first place? That, that's a great question. You know, actually, when we started out, it wasn't, you know, we didn't really have a clear idea. Um, um, it wasn't like we intended to do ISAs, but a couple of things forced our hands. Um, and the first thing is kind of weird. Uh, it's really around government regulation. So <laughs> uh, in Nigeria, if you want to teach anybody anything, you got to be licensed. Um, and you've got to be licensed as a monotechnic institution or a university or something like that. And the license requirements are not just onerous, but it takes a lot of political um, clout to actually get the approvals. So we actually started out paying folks because we didn't want to, um, we, we wanted to say we were employers rather than an education institution so we could avoid the licensing. Uh, and, and the other thing about the licensing was the government determines what you teach. <laughs> so it was all around a bad deal for us to be very honest. Um, and so as a result, we decided, look, we, 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 we just, you know, our, our preference was basically just to be the guys who tell you, you, you know, who teach you, um, because we wanted to teach our own stuff. You know what I mean? So, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't, we, we, we didn't go with what the government wanted us to teach because it was old, outdated stuff. And also we, um, we didn't want the government to have to license us because we probably won't get the license. Um, so that was, that was what actually led to us um, paying people. But I think as we started paying people, we realized something, which was like, not only were we getting out of government trouble, but folks were just super focused. Because a lot of people um, who came to our program, I mean, they were not rich kids. They couldn't afford um, to just kind of spend all their time um, coding. So even if we're able to provide them with computers and, and internet and all the other stuff and even food, um, it was just important to them that they were getting paid so they could focus, they could kind of send some money back home uh, to their families and then they could focus on just getting work done. And that, that and housing were the two things that literally changed our program and made our results so, so much dramatically better than everybody's, everybody else's. Yeah, I think it's surprising what a lot of people, you know, how much better a lot of people can perform when they just don't have to worry about, you know, simple things like food and housing. Uh, you free people up to, you know, go and learn and go and uh, improve themselves and everything like that. Yep. Yep, precisely. So you went on after that and you left uh, after, after a couple of years, certainly, you know, getting it off the ground to to say the least, and, you know, establishing it as a successful company, then you went and you did uh, Flutter Wave. Uh, and I think you spent, I think that was like a YC born company. Is that right? Yep. That was a YC company. Um, um, we, we, we started out with YC super early and uh, that was huge for us because I think we're the second company in, um, in YC, second Nigerian company in YC. Right. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, both of these experiences, like objectively outside looking in super successful, uh, and you left both relatively early. And, uh, I think maybe earlier than some would have expected, uh, probably left like some comfort on the table and some success monetarily on the table. But oh, obviously, yeah, you know, obviously it seems to me that you have like these bigger plans and your your perspective on life you, you know you might have a bit more of like a philosophical view of uh what matters to you what you want to spend your time doing uh what you know you left both of them after like really significant capital raises for example 
what was going through your mind? Like what's driving these decisions where you're just kind of on to the next and you keep, you know, I think you said something about like, you thought you were maybe going to retire, but next thing you know, you know, fast forward a year or two and you have like three or four massive projects again. Uh, what's kind of at the root of like driving you? I mean, I think for me, really, it's um, an understanding of the fact that I think, you know, when I came into the market, I really just came in thinking about making money for myself. <laughs> and I was just like, well, Canada is a little hard. Nigeria is a little easier. Uh, I know people, so and I can get stuff done a lot easier. So uh, why don't I start a business in an emerging market? But over time, as I kind of got involved, um, you know, building stuff, I just realized how much transformational impact it's possible for you to have because of technology and innovation and how easy it was, well, not easy, but possible it was to turn our biggest challenges in Africa into global business opportunities and how much the world needed people, more people to be able to do that. And I think that's what's captured my imagination. And we started with talent because talent is super critical, right? for all this stuff. So, you know, talent is, 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 is important. But, you know, we quickly realized that, look, talent wasn't enough if people couldn't earn a living for whatever it was they were doing. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, if, if people couldn't make things and get paid for it without having to have a long meeting with a bank or beg for 70, 30% of the revenue they generated from a telecoms company, I knew it wasn't going to work. You know what I mean? So I... So, th so that was what led me um, to then uh, kind of push very, very hard in the direction of uh, building, you know, um, you know, this, this uh, 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 um, building all these different things. And, and actually, I think for me, what I want to see happen is we, I, I've, I've been, I've had the pleasure of watching a number of ecosystems be built from scratch. So even in Waterloo, Waterloo, uh, when I got there, the biggest company was BlackBerry, was the height of the BlackBerry mania, and iPhone just came out. And, you know, the entire ecosystem of Waterloo got decimated by the iPhone uh, because BlackBerry kind of just went in the toilet. Uh, but then the ecosystem rebuilt itself from scratch, and Waterloo is now back to one of the top startup ecosystems uh, in the world. And I saw New York do the same. I saw Boston do the same. I watched a bit of Silicon Valley do the same after um, um, the crisis, um, you know, in kind of the early 2007s and so uh, 2010 time, you know. So I, I, I've seen this happen many times. So I have absolute faith that this can be done in Africa. Um, we just have to be focused on the right problems. So you talked about the financial crisis in the U.S. and the challenges that came with that for, for companies out in like Silicon Valley. Um, you've got a lot of experience building in kind of adverse environment. I think Andela was during the midst of Ebola crisis and uh, flutter wave with, with the financial crisis locally and in Nigeria. Um, I've also heard you talk about like, you know, the, the saying the obstacle is the way uh, now, obviously we have, you know, a pretty large glaring obstacle on, on a global scale. We've got the pandemic and the economic impact that that's come with it. Uh, really on a scale that, that hasn't really been seen, at least in, in our lifetimes. Um, how do you think about the, you know, the disadvantages, but also the advantages of uh, building in a time that's so tough? And, you know, for people who are starting their companies, maybe this year or, or next year out of this crisis, uh, what's the, you know, what can you get from, from being able to succeed out of a time like that? And it's, it's interesting. Um, I think, first of all, you do really get at the heart of people's motives for building. Um, whenever things are very, you know, bubbly like they sometimes are, <laughs> um, people, people tend to think about, sadly, you know, with the, they, they, they tend to misjudge the risk and tend to be there for the wrong reasons. Um, and so it's really important that there is um, some clarity. And I think uh, time, rough times really give you clarity because you know why you're there. I uh, was just sharing an experience with my team. You know, we were working on an investment that didn't come through for our fund. And, you know, after that, everyone was just devastated. And I was just like, man, like, <laughs> this is amazing because um, it gives us just so much clarity about, you know, why we're here, what we're trying to do. And if anyone had doubts about why they're here and what they're trying to do, like now is a good time to clear those doubts, either by walking away or by, you know, staying put. 
Um, and that's how I see startup ecosystems. Like when things are bubbly, people are there for all sorts of reasons to get the right resume so they could go to business school. Uh, people are there to make money. People are there to get some stock so they could go sell it. You know, <laughs> all sorts of people are there for all sorts of reasons. But in desperate times, like you only have soldiers, people who are there explicitly for the purpose of helping the company battle through the uncertainty to the glorious future that they've imagined. Um, so I think those times are extremely, extremely important. I, I, I build businesses. I like to build businesses specifically in those times. Well, this, this is a good time then. And I know you're helping a lot of businesses get off the ground uh, with your current project and everything that falls under it with Future Africa. Uh, I want to talk a lot about that. And I know it comes down to three kind of core tenants, which is uh, you know, community, capital, and coaching. Uh, let's start with community because I think that's how it started. And, and then you kind of realized like, well, we can talk about it or, or we can actually go and start building it and start funding it and everything like that. But when it comes to community, uh, you know, times like these put a highlight on the importance of like in-person communication when everyone's on Zoom and, and you know, everyone's working remote. And there's obviously advantages of that, that you don't you know, have to be in any one specific place to be able to, to get paid and do a good job and uh, sell your skills. But at the same time, you know, the community building aspect can, can be a little bit difficult. What have you guys found early on with Future Africa? trying to build that community, you know, the importance of, of in-person, but at the same time having like this online written content and, and community where people can get together. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, that was the original idea, you know, that's actually the funniest part, right? Like <laughs> the original idea was just, you know, we have this platform where people could get together. And then we realized that people on the platform wanted to do more. They wanted to be able to support early stage businesses. They wanted to be able to receive capital coaching, and coaching from from us uh, and so we had to now kind of build out the platform to be able to do more than just you know talk about the future and provide a rallying point for people who believe in the future to talk about um, the future they were building and the opportunities um, and and it's been exciting so far I mean um, you know just from you know being just a, a glorified forum uh, just last quarter we we we, we pushed out uh, a million dollars, we deployed a million dollars to nine companies. And, um, uh, you know, we've written checks ranging from $25,000 to $250,000. So interesting stuff. <laughs> and, and this like influence or, or rather uh, maybe focus on, on community. I understand like a large part of your development was, um, I think it was called the co-creation hub. Was that like an early community that, that helped you get off the ground that in some ways inspired uh, you know, your, your focus on that today? Um, you know, I would say yes, to some extent, um, to some extent. Um, but I think that, you know, what, what actually to be very clear, what it helped us, what it helped us do was bring people together and then give us a forum for having, engaging them. So I remember we had um, a former member of our team, amazing young woman, her name is Eric Ken. Um, she basically went and had like over 200 calls with members of our team and showed us the research, which was, look, people are looking for capital <laughs> because you can be as community friendly as you want. But if you want to get capital from your platform, they're like, what, what's going on? And I need to build stuff and building stuff costs money. So what's going to happen? Um, and then they told us they needed coaching and how to build a better businesses. And then most importantly, they did value the community that we're already building. And so those were basically became the building blocks for kind of how we serve um, the folks, uh, the innovators that, that we're empowering um, to, to turn Africa's biggest challenges into global business opportunities. So you mentioned obviously capital is key. Uh, and that was, you know, you might've started Future Africa on a, you know, focus on community, but eventually realize like we need to start building, we need to start funding and coaching. Um, can you talk a bit about the Future Af Africa Collective? Uh, what went into like designing that? Because it's not a typical, you know, way of, of financing yeah. startups. <laughs> Absolutely. So when we started the fund, um, you know, we had, we, had, we had done a lot of learning through 2019. And then 2020, we came in like everybody else, guns blazing, wanted to do this amazing thing. I moved to Nigeria from the Bay Area. And I was, I was trying to raise a fund in the Bay Area. I wasn't making a lot of traction. But then I got to Nigeria, expecting to continue the conversations, and COVID hit. So 
I lined up a bunch of companies that we were going to fund and I just couldn't see myself not making those commitments. And I didn't have any money. I had some money, but I didn't have that much money on me, you know, because I just made this very expensive move halfway across the world. And so a member of my team, uh, we had a paper from last year where we had talked about, you know, what would it look like if we built um, a micro VC fund where fees um, were more from your limited partners rather than from uh, a broader, uh, like a broader community. You know what I mean? And the reason for that was because, you know, one of the things we'd always complained about was like, if you raise the $5 million fund, how much are your fees, right? <laughs> I mean, they, they can probably just be one member of the team. You know what I mean? And, and not more than that. So how could we think about a more democratized version of VC? Because all these institutionals weren't picking calls. They were telling us, come back next quarter or never. So how do we do it? Um, so so that, was, that was basically what, what we were working on. Um, and, and, and basically, you know, that was, that was how we, we kicked off. Um, and, um, and so we put out a call, we had a company that we thought was amazing. We put out a call and, and asked people if they would want to invest in the company. And in a couple of hours, um, we had, we had raised, um, in a couple of hours, we had raised million, uh, we had, sorry, not million, we raised a hundred Within three, sorry, within three days, we had raised like close to $100,000 for the company. And that made us um, extremely hopeful that um, it was going to be possible for us to actually do something incredible um, with, uh, with the platform. And, um, and then we started to accept memberships. And so far, I mean, since uh, March when we started this, um, we've accepted now about 125 members, uh, co-investment members, um, and, and we funded, um, you know, very uh, close to about, uh, you know, uh, 1.4 1. or $1.5 million. Now, now, the way the platform works, for those of you who are wondering, is really simple. So you go to future.africa slash collective, you apply to be part of the collective. Um, when you apply, um, we approve you, and then you're given an opportunity to join the collective. Now, joining the collective means that you're paying $1,000 a year to us and we in exchange will give you 20 companies a year you know so we'll give you detailed information investment memos um, data forecast about 20 companies a year Uh, every two weeks we send them drip drip emails Um, and you know you can invest in 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 that company and if you know the company get uh, we get a 20 percent carry um, for any investments that you make via the platform through like a specialized SPV. Uh, we also have the rolling fund where every quarter you can actually, um, you know, send us, send, send us money and um, we can invest that money in all the companies that we invest in. So our anchor funding for the syndicates, um, which are like these special SPVs on a deal by deal basis come from the rolling fund. Um, so it's, it's an exciting uh, opportunity for investors because uh, a lot of, investors who want to get into angel investing but need quite a bit of guidance uh, or want to work with an experienced investor to be able to know what to invest in in Africa, you know, are able to leverage uh, the platform that we provide them to do so. Yeah, it it sounds like a pretty intriguing offer. It's like a thousand bucks a month or a thousand bucks a year, I think you said for, um, you know, what what do you say, 20 leads a year for, for an investment that they can, you know, they don't really have to, they can diligence more, I guess, if they want, but you've kind of done the work and also you've, you've done the work to get the opportunity to invest in the first place and you're connected locally, obviously. So it's a pretty yeah. good deal. It sounds like, and 20% carry is like, you know, fairly standard, I think. So it's, it's a pretty good deal for people who want some exposure and some ability to invest in, in startups in Africa. Uh, who have you seen been like receptive thus far? Is it like local people uh, that you know? Is it people you've worked with like in Silicon Valley, kind of a combination? Yeah. Um, just just to repeat the question, are you thinking, might I look at something in Silicon Valley? <laughs> is that what you were asking? Actually, just like who is uh, contributing to, you know, the Future Africa, Africa Collective? Uh, you've got these LPs on this pretty unique deal where they're just paying a thousand bucks a year and yeah. they get exposure to all these investments if they want to invest. The people like on the LP side, the people who are uh, funding. Oh yeah, who are, you know, through who are you, they? Who, yeah, who are they? 
I'm, I mean, I'll be honest. I, 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 I I'll, I'll mention a few names. Um, I, I know I, at least one of the more prominent folks is Sahil. <laughs> and I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying his name. Um, but for a lot of the other folks, I haven't asked them if I could... <laughs> If I could mention their names, if you understand what I'm saying. Oh yeah, no, um, no worries. I was so just curious. I, I, so I, no, no, like... I know, but they're the, 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 the kind of people who are subscribing. There's quite a number of folks from Silicon Valley, by the way. Uh, a lot of them are GPs of funds that are interested in Africa and looking forward to investing in Africa. That's primarily kind of uh, the kind of folks that we're attracting. Um, also, a lot of uh, large financial institutions in Africa as well who are looking at what deal flow is in Africa and want to invest in Africa. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I didn't mean to, you know, put you on the spot to drop names. I no, was just curious, it's fine. It's uh, fine. like what what the kind of demographic was. If it, and it sounds like yeah. it's, a, it's a combination, um, but you, yeah, yeah, you had... and, then, and then, yeah, yeah, one more group of people that are super important. Like I've had incredible support from the African diaspora in the valley. Like those are probably my biggest contingent. Um, where, you know, you got folks work at Google, Airbnb, so on and so forth. They like excited about investing in Africa via the future Africa platform. Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of ways to, to support where you're from, right? Like on the one hand, you can go to America and, and you can make a career and send some money back home. On the exactly. other hand, you can, you can do what you're doing and you went and got an education uh, in Canada, but then you came back and, and realized mm-hmm. you had some advantages back home to, to build a better business and make a bigger impact. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's exactly what it was. Um, so super excited for, for, for those who are enabling us from over the seas. <laughs> so you, you've had a lot of success so far, my understanding, investing, you've, you've had like a 50% IRR over the last, uh, I don't know, five years or so. Um, what are you looking for? Like when you're finding these African tech startups, obviously you had a lot of success yourself. So you might kind of know what that looks like when you see yourself and someone else but what are like the key things mm-hmm. you're looking for is it market is it the people um would love to just kind of hear your approach yeah um so i mean w- w- when i look at a company uh, when i when i look at businesses i i start first with the market right i just want to understand from a market perspective uh, is there a problem here to solve right Is there um, something that people are not able to access um, as a result of, you know, perfunctory issues or scaling issues or political issues? You know what I mean? So that's kind of my starting point. And once I establish that, then, um, and so so we're very much market-led, not idea-led. And many times, actually, we would identify an area where we want to invest before we find founders, you know, who want to invest there. Um, the, so, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, the second thing is um, then, then when we meet with the team, we're obviously evaluating a couple of things about the team and how they present their idea. And the first one is talent. We really want to understand the founders, what they've done before, um, what matters to them, um, how they've performed, whether they've worked together. All these things matter a lot to us. Um, we want to understand the founders and why they're passionate about this problem. Um, then, then we, we want to understand how well the founder understands the market. Now, keep in mind, uh, many times we look for businesses where we already have studied and have an understanding of what possible solutions could look like um, and have ideas about the market because we studied it, right? We don't just like take ideas in random areas where we don't know what we're doing. Um, so we want to understand, like, you know, does the founders... Um, data-backed perspective of the market? Is it either something, like, does it make sense to us? Um, Are we learning something new from their perspective, right? Um, Are we learning something that we we wouldn't learn any way, any other way? (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, Are we, are we, and and do they actually even understand? Because a lot of founders sometimes don't really know what they're talking about. Um, Then then the next thing is, um, is, um, is design. You know, want to understand how the founders thinking about design for their product from like who informed the design of the product to, um, you know, what, 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 what are they prioritizing in the design of the product? Ease, scale, growth. We want to have a clear sense uh, of what that is and, and get a sense that, you know, there is um, a design that is not just optimized for profit, but also for impact because there are many ways to, opt- to design something in a way that optimizes for profit rather than for impact. 
Um, then the next thing that we want to find out is, um, is you know, distribution. So like what, what kind of sales strategy do they have? What kind of marketing strategy do they have? What kind of partnerships are they uh, able to create? Or what kind of partnerships are we able to create for them? You know what I mean? Uh, what kind of sales are we able to do for them? So these things are extremely important. And uh, once we, once we uh, do that, then you know, we're, you know, we, we understand uh, clearly and uh, uh, we, 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 we kind of tend to put things together from that angle. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes good sense. And, and I think, you know, whatever you've been doing, it's, it's been working so far. So, uh, you know, keep, keep going on that. Um, it, it sounds like, you know, some of these investments, obviously, you find the market, you find the talented founders and entrepreneurs, and they've got a good design, and they know what they're talking about. Uh, you know, they've got some sense of, of profit, obviously, but also they want to make an impact. All these things kind of click and add up and you find a great company. And you think it's going to be the next end dollar or the next flutter wave. Um, but like, I understand from, uh, I was reading the, the intro on your rolling fund um, talks about how you have like this strategy. And I don't know if this is totally accurate or, or if this was just what was on the page when you launched it, but uh, where you basically plan to uh, exit like via secondary market. I assume some of these investments, yeah. once they have a valuation over a hundred million dollars. Absolutely. Uh, and so like from, from my perspective, you know, if you hit some of these big winners, that kind of caps your upside. Like a lot of people uh, like investing on the, on the venture model, they expect that like two or three big winners can make the portfolio, even if the rest are losers. How are you, you know, do you have such a high, do you expect to have like such a high hit rate on this early investment to hundred million dollar level that you can kind of afford to stay in that, in that early market cash out once you have the successful companies get through that threshold and then you know be able to reinvest some of that and really just focus I, I guess the question is like what drives your focus on like this early stage and like once we get to a certain point we're just going to cash out and reinvest yeah i mean you got you got the right idea i think for us you know what we're prioritizing is enabling early stage investment rather than just making a blowout return <laughs> um i mean yeah there's a there's room for greed but um I think the way we can think about these things um, is more strategic, which is, you know, one of the reasons why we exist is that there is a very, very um, horrible seed stage funding problem for people who are looking for commercial capital between the 25K and 250K. You know, a lot of African countries, actually a lot, of, a lot easier to find grant funding between 25K and 250K. But this is the money that people need to be able to actually get off the ground, if you get what I mean. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, this is, this is why, um, you know, we, we, we are particular about, um, about supporting startups at that very early stage. And so getting to a hundred million is, um, a huge milestone for a startup, um, a hundred million dollar valuation, uh, because that then, you know, it gives you a real launch pad, you know what I mean? And, um, and so what we try to do when we work with startups that get to that valuation is, is, um, is basically, you know, how can we, how can we help you? How can we support you? You understand what I'm saying? Um, and um, it's typically not capital. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we remain involved in a company's life and we never really sell off all our stake in a company, except we feel like they've reached what we call our target price. Um, <laughs> and then um, we're, we're very deliberate about exits because we think, you know, as a company gets bigger and bigger, it's, it's actually different kinds of risk. You know what I mean? So uh, that we're equipped to support the company with. Um, so our approach is really kind of, you know, when the company gets to $100 million, we exit for, um, you know, at least the principle of the amount. And then we go, uh, we go from there. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I, I think it's actually, you know, really smart. I, I didn't understand, I guess, from the rolling fund that you were, you know, in some cases keeping a piece. And it sounds like it's like kind of a, the best of both worlds where, you know, on the one hand, you're realizing like, this isn't, you know, a hundred million dollar plus company. This isn't really our game anymore. And like, we're happy to, to advise and stay involved, but we're going to kind of decrease our share in equity alongside like our decrease in, in being the ones to be, you know, right-hand man at this point in the, in the company's life. But then you get to take those profits off the table and those returns and go reinvest them back in your sweet spot, which is like, 
keeping the, the wheel going on some of this early stage seed funding where there, there's a lot more need for it. So I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, makes perfect sense. Yeah. So you had a, a tweet that I saw recently that, that went a little viral. Um, it was retweeted, I think, by both uh, Balaji and Mark Lauder, both you know, were, were kind enough to come on the podcast previously and were great to talk to. Um, you know, it was basically saying that companies in Nigeria should, should be incorporating abroad, keeping their assets in Bitcoin and investing in a VPN so that they can't have their, you know, internet service uh, limited in any way by government or, or whatever else it might be. Yep. Can you just tell a little bit yep. of the story of like how you came to those learnings? And I want to ask a question on Bitcoin after <laughs> as well, but uh, I, I wouldn't sure. be doing my job if we didn't talk about Bitcoin a little bit, but um, I'd love course. to hear kind of how of you course. came to those learnings. Well, yeah, I mean, so I don't know how much of the news you're watching from Nigeria, but Nigeria's had a very um, interesting month <laughs> or two. Um, we've had police brutality protests for the last couple months, um, um, weeks, actually. We, like last month, basically, we had a lot of police brutality protests where people were basically protesting um, the government's um, security forces consistent brutality against young people who they had profiled because they had dreads or because they had tattoos and they were harassing them for that reason and that reason alone. Um, and, um, and so in the middle of these protests, um, you know, um, there were at some point in the protest, things got a bit heated. Um, and naturally, you know, just like it happened in the U.S., there were a few, a few, uh, there were some riots, right? There was some destruction of property and things like that. Um, but however, the, 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 the one day that got really, really bad was um, this one day where, you know, the, 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 the army um, decided to start shooting peaceful protesters at the Lekki Gate. So very much a Tiananmen Square kind of situation. You know what I mean? Where people were basically killed. Um, in broad, you know, well, it, nighttime, but <laughs> they were basically killed for for requesting their rights peacefully, um, singing the national anthem and waving the national flag. Um, and so, what 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 had happened next? You know, obviously there was a wave of violence across across the country because of these needless deaths, and um, the government then decided that that gave them a justification, which obviously doesn't to basically go after the protesters. So they arrested quite a number of protesters, um, peaceful protesters, by the way, um, blocked accounts. Actually, they'd be blocking accounts from the beginning. Um, a lot of institutions of state were politicized in order to support the protests, uh, in support the government's backlash against the protests, even though it wasn't justifiable and everything was peaceful. And that was the background for my statement. So, you know, I had, a, I had a, some friends um, who run NGOs and their company, um, the, a replica of their company, it wasn't actually their company at the end of the day, um, got, um, got shut down by, by the police, <laughs> uh, by, the, by the Corporate Affairs Commission. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, that was number one. Number two, um, the governor of the central bank um, went and got court orders requesting um, the shutdown of accounts of peaceful protesters and people who were funding things like food um, at the protest grounds, medical help for those who needed medical help um, and things like that. You know what I mean? Um, so that was just like ugly. <laughs> um, and then most importantly, um, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the, the government was considering a ban on social media quite seriously. You know what I mean? Um, so, so all those three things kind of came together to really create this impression um, that the government um, seems to be all out against young people and that there was a need to de decouple from the Nigerian government. And I think, you know, for me, I mean, I look at that and I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't, I'm not as extreme in my point of view about it, like in the sense that I think there are elements in the Nigerian government who are actually trying to abuse powers for political reasons, uh, not the entire government itself. That's my belief. Um, but I also think that there's a real case there um, for young people who are watching um, to decouple from the Nigerian government, so to start using Bitcoin. Because what happened was 
there was actually this women's group called the Feminist Coalition, which was taking a lot of, um, um, helping a lot with food, medical help, legal aid, all that kind of stuff during the protests. And, um, and their accounts got frozen uh, by the central bank. And then they switched to Bitcoin, <laughs> right? Um, so, so there is a real case for decoupling from the Nigerian government. And basically my tweet was to warn the government to say, look guys, uh, you, you are basically creating a, a practical case for people to decouple from the Nigerian government. You know what I mean? So <laughs> this, uh, the, the, that was basically the point with the tweet. Yeah, I think it was, you know, obviously you had your reasons for for coming upon that perspective. And uh, I think like people in the States, like myself included, you know, we talk about the the fact that government can be, you know, you, like Bitcoin is, you know, uh, safe from government censorship. But no one in the United States really has like, you know, outside of people who are maybe uh, criminals uh, as defined by the government, but they don't think what they're doing is wrong, which there's certainly a, a group of, of those kinds of people, you know, like someone who might be, uh, you know, arrested for, for marijuana and, you know, has their funds seized. I, I don't know of like a specific situation of that, but there's certain crimes that are relatively harmless that uh, the government might come down somewhat unfairly, but the vast majority of like the U S citizenry, we don't really understand that, you know, we understand that philosophically, like principally, but not from experience, but it sounds like in Nigeria, like it's happening, like certain people are having their funds take, taken, excuse me, their companies shut down. Um, and it's like a real concern. And I think more broadly speaking, like Bitcoin and the sort of, you know, it's got its, it's a cool piece of technology and a lot of people are excited about it um, as an investment. But from like, a, you know, again, like a philosophical point of view, people are excited about like the censorship resistance and, you know, the, the fact that scarcity is permanent and it can't just, you know, people can't just print Bitcoin like the U.S. is printing dollars. Yeah. Uh, but or, in, or Nigeria is printing Naira. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And this is happening all, all around the world. The U.S. obviously has has one of the more yeah. stable currencies. And, and, and again, you have a big problem here. You, so right now, I mean, people believe that there's 30% inflation. Um, um, and to make things even worse, you know, the, there's a lot of exchange rate controls here, um, w which people are basically uh, bouncing off. Um, so, so there's a real, actually Bitcoin is growing. I've had a bunch of very, very big um, Forex dealers in Nigeria basically tell me, look, you know what I mean? <laughs> we're, we're moving to Bitcoin or blockchain, you know? Yeah, I want to paint a picture a, a little bit clearer of this because I think like, again, in the US, it's more of like something that exists in, in people's minds, but in, in Nigeria and maybe the rest of Africa and some other countries, South America, wherever it might be, it's like a legitimate use case already where it's, you know, on the one hand, it might help foreign trade. On the other hand, it's useful for remittances. And then now you've got like this censorship issue where people are having their, their funds seized. I guess my question for you, obviously, you know, you've been leading the tech scene in some regard out of Africa for a while now. What was like, you know, when did you first come across Bitcoin and how have you seen it develop over time from this thing that's like, oh, that, that could be kind of interesting to uh, now these big Forex dealers are, are talking to you all about it? Yeah, um, I mean, it's pretty interesting to watch because I was, I was a skeptic. <laughs> when I first learned about Bitcoin, I was the biggest skeptic. I just didn't see how, I mean, I was in fintech for that matter. Um, and I was just a skeptic. I, I didn't understand it. Um, but then I read an interesting book called This Little, a little Bitcoin Book by a guy called Timmy Ajiboye and a few other folks. Um, and, and I understood how Bitcoin worked, got to understand how it's created, how it's ended, what problems it's trying to solve, challenges, you know, um, things like that. I, I, and I, I became a believer. Um, I had a three-hour conversation with Jack, <laughs> Jack Dorsey, and that made me even more of a believer. Um, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a very late stage uh, believer in Bitcoin because to be very honest, like before Bitcoin, I, I, I just didn't think it was, it was important. 
you know, I'll be honest with you. I didn't think it was going to be important. I was in a payment company. I was seeing what was going on in the payment space. It was obvious that Bitcoin is and, and will be a threat. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Um, but, you know, I, I, I didn't really understand it. I didn't really understand it. So I, um, I, 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 I underestimated it. And, um, and now I'm, I'm a big believer, especially now I see kind of more or less kind of what the, the government, um, the government is accelerating actually uh, inadvertently um, the, the use of Bitcoin, <laughs> you know, by yeah, this extra blockades, by this, um, uh, you know, real inflation, you know, things like that. Like it's just right now they're just accelerating uh, uh, like crazy the growth of Bitcoin. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, I, first of all, it's cool that you're honest about it. like when I first found it, I wasn't really interested in it, and you know, didn't think it was going to be a big deal. And now, you know, you've changed your mind. I think that that says a lot in its own right. And you know, it might seem late, but I think on a global scale, it might still be really early to be, uh, you know, aware. I agree. Of. I think it's really early. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you mentioned, uh, you know, you talk with Jack for three hours. That's not something you hear from people obviously every day. He's one of the more you know, influential people in the world right now running Twitter and Square and the work he's doing in Africa and evangelizing Bitcoin a bit as well. Uh, and your LinkedIn picture is actually with Zuckerberg. So how are you getting to, you know, talk with these guys and what have you learned? Like, you know, have you had a relationship with them over the years where they've taken you under their wing a little bit or uh, would love to hear like anything that you've gotten from from those relationships? Um. I mean, a lot. I wouldn't say we have that kind of relationship specifically. <laughs> um, they, you know, a lot of folks have come to Nigeria, um, large, large companies, you know, which which, which is great. Um, looking to learn more about the market, and I'm also obviously also looking to learn things from them. You know what I mean? Um, and um, you know, um, I, I. I I, um, you know, I'm, I'm particular about, about those type of, uh, those type of stuff. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, what has been helpful is to really understand how much value they see in Africa and how things that we take for granted, um, they see as, as global solutions to our local challenges. Like they see from our local solutions to our local challenges, solutions that can scale globally. So that has really kind of given me quite a bit of confidence, if you ask me. But, um, you know, I, I mean, I can't say I have like a first name basis relationship with any of these guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have a couple I talk to uh, fairly regularly, but I wouldn't say I'm best friends or anything with them. I think they're doing their thing. They're huge inspirations for us here in Nigeria. But we're also doing our thing and we're kind of, you know, yeah, you know, hopefully people are excited about what we're doing here as well. And that's why they're all coming in to visit. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that, that there's been things that, that you've learned from there, but I didn't mean to, you know, imply. I'm, I'm sure they're learning a lot from you as well. Like, who better to talk to to learn about what's going on in, in business and in tech in, in Nigeria? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know, you know. I, but I'm I, I learning there. a lot from them. I mean, I, I, I look, like I said, you know, I was, I think I once said, you know, I was very inspired um, to get into um, tech by, by Mark Zuckerberg, for example, right? And he later invested in, in Flutterwave through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So really, a lot of our relationship with them are, are coming full circle. They're huge inspirations for us. We learn so much about, you know, building mission-driven companies, about hiring talent. You know, we learn so much from them um, at a distance, of course. <laughs> you know, but, um, but also, you know, I, I would hope they're learning from us as well about uh, how to solve certain challenges and uh, stuff. So I want to talk about Talent City for a second as well before we wrap up. Um, yeah. You're, you're trying to build a city, it sounds like, in Africa. And I've had a few guests, like I, I kind of mentioned Mark Water earlier. Uh, Moya from Zambia was on the show. Uh, people who are interested in, in building uh, cities from scratch, essentially, would love to hear about how this came to be a yeah. priority for you uh, and what kind of a game plan is going in. Yeah, that's a great question. So what I... I mean, for, for me, I initially wasn't interested in a city project. <laughs> um, you know, um, I was, I was uh, what I thought was like, look, you know, um, what we had was good enough. But in the process of building Andela, 
um, I learned quite a lot. And one of the things I learned really was that the barriers to scale when you're building a talent business is the general environment that people um, and quality of life that you're able to guarantee. So you know, with our we built in Lagos and you know, we never, even though we tried our best to provide housing and food and everything we could, we never really got an opportunity to build a bubble. You know what I mean? So people had to interact with the real world. And, and what that meant for a lot of our people was, you know, our people often got caught up in police brutality issues um, where people would, uh, policemen would seize our, they would arrest our people, um, our, our, our co-workers, um, jail them for doing nothing. Um, we had situations where, you know, people didn't have power at home. Um, they didn't have the right internet, so they couldn't get projects done. I mean, we solved quite a number of those problems by providing accommodation ourselves, but just being in an alternate reality meant a lot to people, right? Um, and we weren't able to provide that environment for them at first. Also, we weren't able to scale, right? We, I think we were one of the largest employers in, in, in Lagos, um, I like single employers uh, from that, for, for, for that matter, in one building. And we took up like a you know, six floor building um, called the Akitola William Deloitte building, we used to host um, Deloitte, the accounting firm. Um, and we took up that building almost entirely and it still wasn't enough for us, right? <laughs> so right from that time, we started thinking about, look, you know, how do we, how do we create um, a better environment? You know what I mean? For our people to be able to work, live and play and for them to have high quality of life because we were losing quite a bit of talent to other countries that had figured out infrastructure and quality of life. Um, you know, countries like the, the Netherlands, countries like Dubai, countries like Saudi Arabia, you know, you know, Rwanda. So we're like, how do we claw back on that? And, and so I think for me with Talent City, the big idea is look, how do we build a network of, of cities from which from a policy infrastructure and e-governance perspective, do you understand what I'm saying? Are, are essentially the best places in the world, uh, not just in Africa, to make things on the internet, right? So if you want to build things on the internet, how do we make this your first choice of places to go to uh, in order to build things on the internet? So that's, that's kind of the big, um, the big thing for us um, at Talent City, and that's what we work towards every day. So last question here on, on Talent City. Um, you know, the, the pandemic and the move to digital and, and remote, it's kind of leveled the playing field in a way on, on a global yep, scale. Like absolutely. From anywhere. Uh, and, and people are starting to prioritize, you know, they might not want to be, they might not care as much as about being in San Francisco or New York or, you know, uh, Lagos maybe in, in Nigeria. And they're more willing to go somewhere and, and just work from their computer and enjoy a, a pretty good quality of a life on a beach or something like that. Uh, what's the, you know, what's life like in, or at least what it's going to be like in, in talent city. Yeah. I mean, we're optimizing for a certain kind of technology professional to be very frank. Um, you know, they want quality of life where, where our first site is in a very lush, beautiful state, um, very close to one of the largest mountain, um, mountain forests um, in, in, in Africa. Actually, um, it's the second largest range of mount of, 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 of forests, um, of rainforests after the Amazon. Um, so it's, 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 an, it's in a beautiful geographic location, lots of monkeys, lots of ecological stuff to do. Um, it's also a very historic site. Uh, it's a former slave, um, it's a former slave, um, um, would I say, descent back point. Um, so really we're trying to reclaim those memories for black people, um, particularly from people for, from, from, from Nigeria, um, both um, in the diaspora and people uh, around. Um, and, and it's lots of very hospitable people, really nice place to be. And I think those are, those are things that are, you know, important to us, if you, if, if you get my point. These are very important things for us, you know, being, you know, being, being able to provide that kind of experience. But more importantly, I think what we're really delving deep into, you know what I mean, is um, we're really, really delving into um, 
you know, how do we create the right kind of infrastructure? So we're landing a subsea cable in that area where our first city is. Um, we will bring in, we'll have a few data center clients that are going to be around there. Um, we have, um, we're going to have a, a really interesting school of technology um, and a bunch of talent focused businesses um, in the area, as well as freelancers and stuff like that. So, you know, and even from a, even from a technology point of view, um, an e-governance point of view, like we're really, really focused on, on uh, being able to enable the interactions between businesses, individuals, and the government to be completely digitized. And that's kind of what we're focused on. You know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, these are some of the things that we're just making possible. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Um, yeah, totally. Within, yeah. Within, yeah. Within, the, within the zone. So, yeah, it's going to be an exciting time. <laughs> it's going to be an exciting time. You should just uh, watch out for more information from us about it. Uh, we've been working on it all, all last year. We're very close um, to concluding, uh, but I'm sure by mid next year, we should start to make some really consequential announcements. Yeah, it's great. Um, it's been, you know, I, I want to give you the last word and wrap things up here. Appreciate all the time, but uh, it's been great, you know, learning more about your story and there's just so much I can do like reading and listening to podcasts, but talking to you uh, and, and hearing your perspective uh, on, on a lot of these large missions, you know, you went from starting successful companies to now trying to fund, you know, 10 times, 20 times, a hundred times that many companies and also building a city where they can hopefully all grow out of along the way. So, uh, you Absolutely. know, it's, it's, it's a really ambitious goal, but I think those are the only ones, you know, those are the best ones at least to pursue. Uh, and I'll certainly be excited to, uh, to watch your progress as we go forward here. Uh, but, you know, wrapping yep. things up, would love to give you the opportunity to just point people to where they can learn more uh, about you, about future Africa, about Talent City, uh, whatever it may be. But thanks again and, uh, you know, wish you the best of luck moving forward. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I'll just say, you know, um, we're building something special at the fund. We call it the Fund for Africa's Future, also colloquially known as Future Africa or doing business as Future Africa. And if you're interested in investing in African companies, you should definitely be coming to have conversations with us. Or if you're an African company who wants to get money from us, you should be having conversations with us. And the best place to have these conversations is www.future.africa forward slash collective. Um, that's where we, um, we, that's where we live on the internet. And then, um, if you want to follow us on Twitter, it will be at an African future, um, across all social media platforms. So by all means, feel free to, feel free to work with us, to follow us and everything. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.